Thank you all for coming today. I hope you can hear. I am uh, Roscoe Koppel in the square. And I've been coming to the square for since early March to speak out against military spending. And today we have a group of people, four wonderful, five wonderful Oregonians and folks who have some experience reading, who are going to read us the speech by Mark Hatfield in front of the Senate on August the 2nd, 1989, 22 years ago. One of the things in doing the research about this was that we discovered that Hatfield read that speech, made that speech, exactly 25 years after the uh, Bay of Tonkin incident. So 25 years after Bay of Tonkin, Hatfield made this wonderful speech. Of course, another Oregon senator, Wayne Morris, was one of the two people in uh, August the 7th of 1964 to speak out against the uh, Gulf of Tonkin resolution. But So there's, there's quite a history that Oregon has definitely been engaged in. We have a website, uh, coneorange.com, where we've been putting up videos for the last four months, and hopefully we will get a video here today. So I would like to introduce the speakers all, and then they will follow one another up to read the speech. Scott Tightworth is a retired fireman. He's a teacher and author of a new book about the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, Scott is, uh, is a student of Hindu, he's a student of uh, Eastern wisdom, is what I was going to say. And uh, Scott's going to be the first reader. Second reader is Deborah, and uh, Deborah Buchanan. And Deborah is a poet and uh, editor of Guru Kala. Uh, and I don't know a lot about the magazine, but I have seen it, and it is very beautiful, the job that Deborah does. It's quite wonderful. Dave Milholland, some of you will know. David is uh, the president, and I believe that's correct, president of the uh, Oregon Cultural Heritage Division, which was formed in 1989 to help us all reconnect with our cultural roots in Oregon. David is a writer, he's an activist, and a filmmaker, which I think you recently just finished a film, didn't you? at least co-produced. Finding David Douglas. Yes. Martha Geese will follow David. Martha is a poet and teacher extraordinaire and an activist all her life. And Martha was also one of the people that helped the nascent film community in Portland in the early 70s. And so Nathan, uh, Martha will be reading after David. And then Johnny Stallings, who some of you will know is a fine actor, director, teacher, and uh, recently involved with a wonderful project, a film project with Bushra Zoos about, uh, with, a, with a group of actors from Two Rivers, is it Two Rivers uh, Correctional Institution. And uh, that's gonna be a film that we're all gonna be looking forward to seeing. So Scott, go ahead. And I think if you, Try to yeah, stand right around that. Well, I have a big voice. I don't know about them. Okay. But uh, hi, thanks for uh, coming. And I see most of us are old enough to remember 22 years ago when there were still one or two sane Republicans. Mark was uh, and still is one of them. <clears throat> Mr. President, 23 years have passed since I first arrived in the Senate former governor who came to Washington determined to extricate American boys 
from the chaos and confusion into which this country, wrongly in my view, has sent them in Southeast Asia. Those were difficult times for the nation and difficult times for me personally. In the early years, I found myself in a very small minority. We would give our speeches and cast our votes, and every day, more young people were coming home in body bags and wheelchairs. A couple years later, when the administration began to have problems getting the money it wanted from Congress to prosecute the war, people began to talk about a peace dividend. If we can just win this thing, they would say, there will be a peace dividend for the nation. Money to spend here at home, money which will help wind down the giant war economy. Victory is right around the corner. Light is at the end of the tunnel. In 1970, before some of the interns now working in my office were even born, I rose on this floor to question this peace dividend idea, to express my doubts about this notion that we would one day begin to re-channel our resources, not away from strong national defense, but toward a more comprehensive, more human definition of it. Few people listened then. People wanted to believe that our massive war spending would one day end. So, at least for a couple more years, the money kept flowing into the military. Mr. President, from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War, to the Spanish-American War, through World War II, through Korea, through Vietnam, and through the Cold Wars in between, at no time did the spending for military purposes reduce or diminish after those wars. They reached a peak during the war and then remained at that peak following the war. No build down, only a build up. And no peace dividend, Mr. President, none at all. As we entered this decade, the clarion call went out despite one of the largest and best mil trained militaries in the world, despite a nuclear arsenal of unprecedented destructive power, we were somehow vulnerable. A spending gap is what they called it. And so we began a massive buildup, billions and billions of dollars to catch up. Never mind that this spending gap was as phony as the bomber gap of the 1950s and the missile gap of the 1960s. Democrats and Republicans alike dutifully lined up and marched to the drummer of higher military spending. And so it is that we have gathered here every year since only to play on the margins. Oh, we sound reasonable. No, not yet. We sound reasonable, though some of us are losing our marbles a little. We like to think that we sound responsible. We go to hearings and briefings. We have long debates over this program and that program, this weapon and that weapon. And we cast our votes on amendment after amendment. But when it comes right down to it, Mr. President, we are only playing on the margin. This Congress, a bipartisan majority of this Congress, has approved $2.2 trillion of the $2.23 trillion requested for this defense spending during this decade alone. We have played on the margin so long, Mr. President, that I am afraid we do not even know what the real issues are anymore. We seem to have lost fat sight of the fact that many of the programs we have authorized and are authorizing here again today are intended for one purpose only, and that is mass destruction. We 
we seem to have lost sight of the fact that every dollar we spend on bombs and bullets means that we are underfunding programs to meet the nation's desperate human needs. Health care, education, our war on drugs, low-income housing, prison construction, AIDS research, all of these are part of our national defense. Sometimes, Mr. President, we even lose sight of the margins. Several days ago, the Senate considered an amendment earmarking money for the development of more lethal weapons for our ground troops. More lethal? Even the words have begun to lose their meaning. What is more lethal supposed to mean when some of our troops already carry tactical nuclear weapons on their backs? But nobody even raised an eyebrow. The vote was 98 to 1. And this was 1989 when this was read. I remember back in 1981 when 10 subcommittees of the Senate Appropriations Committee were forced to make $9.9 billion in cuts from domestic spending so that defense spending could be increased by $7.4 billion. We can no longer afford to fool ourselves. I said in the committee, but oh, how wrong I was. The nation's defense budget has almost tripled in the past decade with our bipartisan blessing. And spending to meet the desperate human needs throughout this country has been cut and cut and cut again to pay for it. Some 33% reduction in the non-defense discretionary programs in the last decade. Could somebody tell me if there is some secret strategy, some finite figure that we will one day reach and then suddenly be secure? Will we ever have enough? I do not think so, Mr. President. We are like the thirsty man in the desert who thinks he sees an oasis ahead, but when he moves closer, it moves too. Further and further, or for us, higher and higher. And as his thirst finally kills him, our lust for bigger and better weapons of mass destruction is going to destroy us one day too. Mark Hatfield, Senator from Oregon of the Republican Party, the peace wing of the Republican Party, a party of one at that point, continues. Peace through strength is a fallacy, Mr. President, for peace is not simply the absence of a nuclear holocaust. Peace is not a nation which has seen its teenage suicide rate more than double in the past two decades. Peace is not a nation in which more people die every two years of gunshot wounds than died in the entire Vietnam War. Peace is not the town in Pennsylvania which last year was forced to cancel its high school graduation because officials believe that a group of students planned to commit suicide at the ceremony. And peace is not here in Washington, where after leading the nation in murders last year, children are beginning to show the same psychological trauma as children in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Can we really believe that the decisions we have made and are making do not have a direct relationship to the violence which plagues our nation? I suggest that we consider changing the motto on our coins, Mr. President. It now reads, in God we trust. But by blindly pursuing the nuclear arms race, by putting the destruction of life over the preservation, destruction of life over the preservation of life, we have forsaken our trust in God. As E.B. White once put it, we have stolen God's stuff. Our motto ought to be, bombs we trust. That is our national ethic. That is the example we are setting here on this floor. When it comes to debating campaign finance reform and limits on honorarium, everyone seems eager to talk about ethics in government. But there is no ethical dimension to the arms race, to our abuse of our natural and human resources, to our waste of scientific genius, to the bankrupting of the federal treasury to pay for weapons of mass destruction. Is there no ethical dimension to our decision, our conscious decision to add more and more weapons to our stockpiles? While millions of people in our own country have no roof over their heads, when we cannot fund our war on drugs, 
Is there no ethical dimension to the violent examples we are setting for our children? Is there no ethical dimension to the definition of national security that we are passing on to the developing nations of the world, where arsenals are now as bloated as the bellies of the third world's children? There are those who will point to the INF Treaty, the first arms control agreement between the United States and the Soviet Union in 16 years, as if that somehow legitimizes everything. Never mind that these are the same people who spent almost a decade doing everything they could to sabotage the arms control negotiations, never believing the Russians would agree to on-site air inspection. Their message now to the millions of children in this country who do not get enough to eat, to the millions of children who have not been fully immunized, to the thousands of babies who die each year because their mothers receive no prenatal care, to the 37 million Americans who have no health insurance, their message is, see, it was worth it. These are the same people, Mr. President, who accepted the twisted logic which says we must, which says we must produce nerve gas to negotiate a treaty, which says we must continue nuclear testing, testing to ensure safety. A safe nuclear weapon? Mr. President, I wish George Orwell could sit in on these debates. The INF Treaty, it's a big deal. In the six months before the time the INF Treaty was signed here in Washington, the time it was ratified on the floor, the United States and the Soviet Union deplored more nuclear weapon warheads that will be eliminated under the treaty. That's right. We spent and spent and spent so that the administration could negotiate from strength. For all our money, all our weapons, the only thing we received in return was a tiny little dent in the stockpile we had just created. And then, in an incredible display of how distorted our frame of reference has become, how low our expectations have sunk, everyone cheered as if it was the end of the nuclear arms race. To those who suggest that I am naive, I respond, I have been there. As a young naval officer, I walked through the rubble of Hiroshima. A month after the bomb was dropped, I saw the death, the agonizing pain, the charred bodies. As we stand here playing on the margins, Mr. President, as we stand here voting 98 to 1 for the development of more lethal weapons, the stench of death haunts me still. Five years ago, we could say that we did not know. Now we know. Let me read just a few lines of John Hershey's Hiroshima. He found about 20 men and women on the sand spit. He drove the boat onto the bank and urged them to get aboard. They did not move. And he realized that they were too to lift themselves. He reached down and took a woman by the hands, but her skin slipped off in huge glove-like pieces. Then he got into the water, and though a small man, he lifted several men and women into the boat. Their backs and their breasts were clammy, and he remembered uneasily the great burns he had seen during the day. Yellow at first, then red and swollen, with the skin slewed off. He lifted the slimy living bodies out and carried them up the slope away from the tide. He had to keep consciously repeating to himself these are human beings. These are human beings. Strategic defense initiative, anti-satellite weapons, the Midget Man, the MX missile, the stealth bomber, nerve gas, the D-5 missile, the Trident submarine. I will cast my vote against them all. Since 1980, Mr. President, I have given more than 30 speeches during our annual consideration of this bill. Seven against nerve gas production, five against underground testing, three against SHASAC weapons, 
three against the MX missile, three against the draft, two against SDI. The list goes on and on. But I have felt over the years like I am speaking in a vacuum. We have approved them all. And I speak in a vacuum today. My colleagues will listen politely and vote for it all. And I will feel that way too, as I have felt for years now, when I cast my vote against the final passage of this bill, for I too am playing on the margins. And uh, this is the conclusion of Mark Hatfield's speech that he gave on August 2nd, 1989. Uh, and the title of the speech is, Peace Through Strength is a Fallacy. In the absence of political will, on this floor and across the country, in the absence of the kind of political will we seem to be able to muster when the Department of Defense needs another increase, but not when children go hungry, anything more is impossible. Mr. President, unfortunately, we only have had one President of the United States who, in my view, understood national security, national defense. He was a five-star general, Dwight David Eisenhower. Mr. President, these are his words, and this is a quote from uh, President Eisenhower. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. This is not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from the cross of iron. That's the end of uh, Eisenhower's quote. This was the man who led the troops. This was the man who led the Allied troops in World War II. He understood war, but he also understood peace. We are kidding ourselves, Mr. President. Today, we are vulnerable. The national defense of this nation has left us vulnerable, but not because we lack an arsenal. The vulnerability of this nation today is that we rank at the bottom of the list in math and science, and that at least 20 million Americans cannot read or write. The vulnerability of our nation is the deterioration and erosion of our infrastructure, our highways, bridges, airports, and ports. Our vulnerability today is a non-productive economy, a non-competitive economy. Our vulnerability is the people who are without homes, nutrition, education, health care. Ultimately, the security of the nation is not found in its materialism. It is found in a spirit. It is found in a strength of heart and mind. It is found in its people. We, the people. We, the people, are vulnerable today. Let us at least be honest. We are not addressing those vulnerabilities with this bill or any other bill. That's it. Thank you guys, that was wonderful. I'm gonna leave you with one thought. In doing the research on this, one of the things that I came across was that Oregon this is just one state in the union. Last year, we just passed a budget for $15 billion. That's for two years of all of the services that Oregon provides. In that same two-year period, Oregonians will pay the Pentagon $20 billion. The same two-year period, $20 billion of Oregonians' money will go to pay for Pentagon weapon systems. One other statistic, you add up all state budgets for all 50 states, and they are $40 billion less than what the Pentagon will get this year. So all the services of all the states receive less 
event. Love there to be discussion if anybody feels like it. Otherwise, thank you so much for coming. Codeline.com.